dear everyone, colleague, friends, brothers and sisters, wherever you are, whenever you are. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I treat you, greet you with all the greetings that you like to have. And particularly for all of you, I wish that you are enjoying a healthy, wealthy, prosperous life, wherever you are and whenever you are. And we pray for the Muslims who are observing the last five days of Ramadan, that they will be praying for all of us, praying for humanity, whether we are Muslims or non-Muslims, so too you should be including your Muslim non-brother, non-brother Muslims and sisters in your prayer in these most blessed days of the year, and most blessed days of Ramadan, where we are going to observe the night of power. Maybe yesterday could be one possibility, tomorrow another possibility, and more. To start with, we need to thank our colleague uh, Ali Shawa for preparing the presentation for me, the media pro, uh, production. Today we are talking about something يعني, like a series, starting a series called Fad Fada. Fad Fada. I am not sure if you know what Fad Fada means in English. Uh, why? Why this fadfada? I'm just trying to say, to discuss it with you. Because we have found, uh, particularly over the last of Ramadan, too many challenges, too many problems, too many competition, and a lot of organizations are competing with one another. No coordination, no cooperation, no collaboration between organizations. And I consulted some of my colleagues in different parts of the world. Some of them are volunteers, young people like you. Some of them are working in England or UK. Some of them are working in Egypt, some of them are working in Sudan to get me a list of problems facing or, uh, or challenges facing the uh, charitable sector that we are facing. And I thank all of them, particularly Dr. Mohammed Bashir, Mr. Lutfi Sayed, Mr. Ahmed al -Hit, Mrs. Hala Fuad, uh, Mr. Ahmed Sheikh and Mr. Uh, Mustafa Maad. Uh, they represent UK organization, Egypt, Sudan, Turkey, Stroke, Syria, and some Syrian volunteers, especially in the last uh, one or two people. Uh, what do I mean by Fadfada? What do I mean by Fadfada? Actually, in Arabic, we know it very well. But what do I mean by Fadfada? I was trying to search in the English meaning of Fadfada. And they found it was exactly the same name of Fatfada. Uh, and they uh, I, I found this. One gets into a loose way of speaking. And when you go home after a very long and tiring day, and you have got backache, you have got headache, you have to untie your tie and take off your uh, uh, shoes off and your socks and relax on a seat. And sometimes we used to do in the good old days, put your feet in a hot path and put some salt in it to loosen the skin and the, the, of, of the feet itself. And maybe your wife or your mother or your colleague or your sister tell you, open up. What's the problem with you? Open up, please. It's one thing. The second thing, which is the meaning it, if you need to release it, please find. Come out. Spill it. Spill it. And this fatfada. Feel free to cut loose. It's another meaning of fatfada. It's another meaning of fatfada. Sometimes it's good to talk. It's a fourth meaning of fatfada. So four meaning of fatfada in the dictionary that I found. This is how I call it the fatfada. Just to clear the air. Bring it out. So why do I call it five to five? Because in the good old days, you remember that they used to list 10, 15, 20, 30 problems on one list. Now I'm going to restrict it to only five problems at each time that I'm discussing these problems with you, as it came to me from my colleagues that, 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 that I mentioned the names before. Uh, OK. Five problems. I'm going to talk about number one is sanctity. Sanctity is the red line. Red line. 
red line, red line. It means it is a state of being safe from violation. It's number one. Safeguarding, safekeeping, security, immunity, inviolability. This is sanctity or state of being sacrosanct, sanctity, holiness, sacrosanctity, sacredness, sancthood, sainthood, sorry, sainthood, sainthness. This is a red line between me and who? Between me and the poor community. I don't cross it unless I take a permission from them. Between me and the refugee, between me and the displaced individual, between me and the individual orphan or the individual widow, between me and the sick man and woman, between me and the elderly man who needs my help, just have to know there's a red line between me and all of them. No matter how much money I have, no matter how much my, my, my organization will bring to them, no matter how much authority I have, whether I come from government offices or from organization offices or from private corporation, no matter what, there's a line, there's a red line between me and those people who call it sanctity. I have to respect their private life. This should be applied also to what? To people's residents. Yeah, when you go to the camp and you find people living in tents, not properly built tents, maybe a tent made out of a piece of cloth or cardboard or uh, what do you call it, uh, plastic pieces, whatever it is, you still, you still have to take a permission from the resident of such a dwelling before you enter this place, no matter how, how strong, how wealthy, and how uh, you are and your organization is. People's resident religion, each religion of us has a sanctity, has to be respected. Faith has to be respected. Family, my family, your family. You don't intrude inside my family or, my, or the family of my relatives and so on, so on, so on. So on. Clans have sanctity. Tribes, communities, neighbors, very serious. Very serious. And neighbors actually to be respected as much as we can. Not to sneak, not to go out behind the back of my neighbors and to chit chat or uh, uh, go out with their daughter or spoil their sons and whatever it is. No, 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 no. So there's horma, there's sanctity for the neighbors as well friends, relatives, and country. So the sanctity is for the poor as well as for anybody else. This is number one problem is facing us, especially when we go to refugees, camps, or community centers where actually people are there depressed and bewildered because they have lost everything. So you have to respect and we have to respect their honor and their sanctity. The second problem we face here, I, I call these problems actually, we'll discuss today personal problems facing refugees. These are personal problems, their personal problems, their personal problems. Second problem is uh, child, child of a poor man, child of a poor family, who, when you go to this area, before crossing, this red line by their permission, what you need to do is you need to read his mind or her mind, see what their dream. You know those children of the poor family? Their dreams may be to eat eggs, may be to eat chicken, may be to eat a piece of meat because they have not seen it for months and years, may be to eat a piece of chocolate, may be to have a small a, a, a football to play, Maybe to have a new pair of shoes. It's a dream. When you go to this family, actually, of the poor family, this is the dream of the children. Very simple. To go to school. Because he's forced to work with his mother and with his father to help the family. Maybe to have a dream. Actually, to new clothes. New trousers. 
new blouse, new skirt. So, these are dreams. Never ever go to this area and look at the children and without understanding that at each, the back of the mind of each one of them, there's more than one dream, many dreams. Because they were hoping that their parents would be able to fulfill their dreams, but they can't because they are poor. It is your problem. It's your role now to understand how those young children will dream. And when they see that you are coming, they think, oh my God, he is going or she is going to make my dream reality. This, this is the problem number two, the person which affecting every individual of the poor family or in the camp of displaced people or refugees. The third problem is problems facing widows. Widows of, of poor family or widows actually coming out of conflict and displacement or becoming refugees. Widow is a widow. The need is the same. The need is the same. There are two kinds of responsibility. First of all, the responsibility to become the breadwinner for the children that they have. You must have one child, two children, three, four, five, whatever it is. So she is responsible for their feeding and their well-being. This is number one. Number two, she is responsible for their protection. She is responsible for the upbringing, for the education. It's an enormous responsibility kept for her because her husband died. It's number one. Number two, problem affecting her, she has a social and physical need, need to be fulfilled. The husband is not there. And the matrimonial relation is not there. And this physically or naturally is needed for the young woman. I saw this young woman, the Syrian one, in Ghazi and Tawa and other places, even in Bosnia as well, how young they were when we met. And how bleak their life became because the husband is not there. Nobody supports them. So she has to be responsible for everything. She has to be responsible for all the dreams of her children. And now when you go to cross this red line, with her permission, you have to understand the enormous problem that she's carrying on her shoulder, plus uh, the, 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 the physical need that she needs as a woman as well. And the social need as well, how the society looks at her as a widow. Sometimes the society look down at a widow, unfortunately. This is the problem number three. When you look at those widows, you have to realize, you know why I'm saying this? Because quite often we measure the value of the life of the widows and the orphan with the competition between one of us as an organization. Sponsorship, sponsorship of a widow is about 40 pound for a orphan, 20 pound. We change them to commodity. Unfortunately, very low understanding of the how to feel that we are humanitarian worker, how charitable work should be. This organization is giving 25 pounds for a sponsorship of a child. This organization is giving 24 pounds and so on. This is not right. This will never fulfill the needs of the orphan and of the widow. Because the needs is here in the heart, in the mind, in the soul before it is in the body as well. This is problem affecting widows among refugees, displaced, poor, and needy people, their dreams, feelings, thoughts, hope, and who we deal with them. This is actually about the widows. Orphans. What's the difference between an orphan child and the child of a poor family? The child of a poor family have two parents, mother and father. At least the young child in a poor family will believe, still believe, that his father will bring everything for him. But with the child who is an orphan, there's no father. So nobody will bring anything for him. So this, this hopes is dashed. It's not there anymore on the table. So that's two 
go inside a dark balloon or bubble because nobody is there. Daddy is not there. And his dream, as I mentioned, about the child of or the children of the poor families, very simple. Pair of shoes, trousers, education, a meal, uh, football, basketball, the ball itself, to play, to run. It's very simple, very simple. But you have to measure it when you look at their, the depth of their soul, inside their soul, the inner soul of the children who have no parents or the children who are parents are very poor. Uh, orphans with a clipped wing who are bruised, pretty broken up about it, about being orphaned, heartbroken, and the others. They have psychological as well as social problems. More than the children who are from a poor family. But they still the custodianship of the parents together, protecting them. But for the orphan, the mother become more vulnerable because the father is not there. Problem number five we discuss today, the respect and the cognition of whom? Of the local community you are trying to, to, to help. When I ask you to raise funds for, uh, for people in Niger, people in Chad, people in Mali, people in Central African Republic, People in in, uh, in in Mozambique, Malawi, in Pakistan, in Sudan, in South Sudan, in Afghanistan, in Bangladesh, in India. People in Argentina. People in Mexico. People in Bolivia, Peru. When you go there, we should never look down at them as a community never ever never ever ever no no way it's number one never at any split of a second we have knowledge they have knowledge we have wealth they have wealth we have experience they have experience as a community we have history they have history who have civilization, they had civilization. Never ever go to them with this top down approach. It's number one. So I have to treat them on equal footage. We are equal because we are all from Adam and Adam being created from clay. Not only that, the local workers in Sudan, in South Sudan, in Malawi, in Liberia, in Gambia. Or don't ever look down at them. They have maybe better experience than young officer in our headquarters who is sitting on a desk, watching a screen and giving order from actually a no experience. And those local workers in this field are the bedrock, the bedrock and the foundation of the success of any work that we are doing. Without the hard work that they are doing where they are in the middle of no man's land, on the top of the mountains, in the middle of the desert, in the shanty towns, in a very difficult time and area, cross, cross zones, war in faction. And to talk about them as they are a fair story, no, they are they are the source of our success. Never, ever, never, ever, never, ever look down at them. At all. At all, at all. Respect them. What make it painful for me is sometimes in a conflict zone. When the, the status become red, the international organization will phone all the expatriates the foreigners to leave the country and leave the local workers for what? For bombardment, for displacement, for the whatever happened to them during the war. And even the social welfare is not as good as our social welfare here 
when we have a state actually is actually a stronger state having very strong social uh, welfare system. So this is the five problems. I mentioned them again. Number one is sanctity of the individuals. Number two is the dreams of the children. Number three is the problem of the widows. Number four is the problems affecting the young orphan children. Number five, the respect, recognition, and dignity of the local community that we are supporting, as well as the local workers that they are working for us in these local communities. How to deal with this problem? I'm not going to book a, to, to make a, a, a magic solution. It's very simple. Let us start with. First of all, there's something called the set of humanitarian principles being created by United Nations and, and the International Committee of Red Cross. Seven principles, as we know it, humanity, transparency, good governance, accountability, impartiality. Uh, one or two, I can't remember them. But this is made to govern the organization. How about the people? For the people, we need to create and make moral principles. While we are having the maintain principles to deal with the affair of how to run the organization, we, have, we, you and me, have to create this kind of set of moral principles to deal with the manner of the people working for these organizations. To deal with the manner of the people working for this organization. Just number one. Number two, to stress on a very fundamental foundation, I am fighting for it the whole of my life. What it is? The real owners of our organization, which is humanitarian, or charitable, or whatever you call it, is the poor, the needy, the orphans, the widows, the sick, the elderly, the displaced, the refugees. It is their money. It is their money. It is their money. The least we can do as workers in these organizations is to try to uplift their standard of life or living to come closer to our standard of living when we live in London or Paris or Rome or New York or Riyadh or Kuwait or Bahrain or Qatar or Emirates or whatever you call these countries. All these countries. This is the least. This is the least, this is the least. But the money of the charity does not belong to you anymore because the master and the owner of these charities is the poor, is the widow, is the orphan, is the sick, is the elderly, is the displaced, is the refugee. We are employees employed by the poor man, by the orphan. And this is the responsibility. To make the haram, to make the pyramid of uh, charitable activity right, not to put it bottom up, oh, sorry, uh, top down. This should be applied to donors as well, as I mentioned. And uh, as I understand, that actually in their wealth uh, is a written right for the bigger and the deprived, even the governments. Once they decide actually that actually uh, this amount of money will be kept for this problem in this country for those people, it is it becomes halas. It becomes owned by the people of this country or this community or this society. And the government has to do one thing, just to safeguard the delivery uh, uh, of the money to the people. And how effective is the program run for those people? Okay? This is number two, number, a, uh, number two. Number three, focus on the woman. Why am I focusing the woman? Woman active and leading participation, particularly in the field. Why? Why I focus on the woman active and leading participation in the field work? Because number one, the 70, at least 70% of the people in displacement and refugees are children and women. Is number one. Number two, women are more sensitive, more common sense than men. 
softer than men. Number three, children and women يعني, feel more comfortable when they found that the one coming to sit down with them is a woman, not a man. And I've seen it many where, everywhere. Uh, number four, when you go into a conservative society, of course, the father, the husband, the uncle, the elderly men will never allow a man to go to see uh, uh, the family. But if it's a woman, a female worker, of course, those people in the conservative area will allow them. So for these four reasons, I am fighting for the Muslim scholar to stand up with a set of criteria of how can you utilize actually the quality sisters among our communities to go and help in these areas for more reasons as well. Number four, in the solution to provide a proper and structured training program and capacity building program. For whom? For volunteers, for staff, new or old staff, for expatriate who does not know the culture. Because sometimes you can get somebody from the West and you send them to an area like uh, Afghanistan or an area like uh, uh, Senegal, uh, Mauritania. Okay? Different culture. So this, this induction has to be there for those expats to, to send them to Muslim area and they're coming from the Muslim area. So on. So they have to understand the local culture, language, religion, before they before they join the mission, whether they are volunteers or staff. This is number four. Number five, which is a new developed criteria or need, which is training uh, the staff on the principles of psychological health and psychosocial support. Especially if we look at actually the children of Gaza, shooting, bombing every day. The children of Yemen, bombing every day. The children of Syria, and so on, and other children as well. So this kind of things. So we have to train all the staff and the principles of psychological health and psychosocial support. And we need to conclude by giving our message to the young people, all of you, all of you, all of you. What's our message for you, young people? Because every talk, I'm delivering it for you to let you to carry on the mission after I leave this life. Our problems that we are facing is not because we have less financial support or less human resources, but it is in how to treat and deal with the needy, with the refugees, with the displaced, how to treat, uh, how to deal with the widows and the orphans, how to deal with those people. We know that actually we need, flow, we need money, we need human resources, that's fine. But if we don't know how to deal with those people, money is no good for us. Human resources is no good for us. It would be a waste. This is number one. The only people who can realize such, such an issue and they can deal with it, and the people who understand what I mentioned earlier on, when they look at the inner soul or inside the internal life of the individuals, people who can look at the broken People with a clip doing, and when you go to the orphans, before you go there, you have to think what the orphans think, thoughts. What is the widow thinking about? It's actually you have to realize before you go and meet with them and sit down with them. You have to understand how bitter is poverty, having a, the bitterness of the taste of the poverty. How difficult to become poor. How difficult to find your child is sick and you cannot treat him or her because you have no money. 
people have to realize that before they address this issue with them. People with mental disability, but really they have sound brain. It's nothing, but actually the brain stopped thinking because of the pressure on the individual, because of the burden on the individual, because of the size of the problem that this individual carrying on her shoulders, especially when I mentioned about the widows. She find herself one day that she is the mother and the father, and she is responsible for two, three, or four children for every social welfare, welfare for them, to protect them, as well as she is responsible to control her desires, her physical needs as well. People with mental disability, but they are, are not really actually mentally disabled, but actually the brain stop thinking. Sometimes because of the pressure you have at work, you sit down and say, oh my God, I can't think. I need to walk out. But for those people, they can't walk out. Where to go? They can't go anywhere. People having normal eyesight sitting with us, but they cannot see us. They cannot see us. They cannot see us. They can't see what's happening around them. Because their, their brain and their mind are shattered somewhere else. The healthy body, but the body cannot take them from A to B. Yani, yani it's, it's psychological paralysis, not, not, not physical paralysis. Those people, you have to, those people are the only people who will be able to understand what's going on at the back of the mind of those individuals that are trying to approach and help. Might be able to provide to this family of ours everywhere, food, clothes, shelter, and means of life. But the big ask is, will you be able to provide them with security, safety, social and societal peace with themselves, tranquility, or not? Food is not everything. Clothes is not everything. Shelter is not everything. It's the peace of mind that we need to uh, provide to those people, young people, when you go and work with them. The role of you, young people, is not to fall or repeat our mistakes again, but to learn from the mistakes of the past, which will make you to be able to face the current challenging reality, then afterwards to draw the dimensions of the future for generations to come. We always should learn from our mistakes. Nobody can live without mistakes. We're not angels, we're not prophets. Even some of the prophets did mistakes. We have to understand that dealing with these groups of people nowadays, it becomes like, a, it's a profession now, like medicine, like engineering, like media, like, uh, uh, like, like politics, all these kinds of, of professions. You like teaching and, and, and. Becomes a profession with different arts, with different arts, principles, morality, values, cultures, histories, messages as well. And so also a divine responsibility is given to you by Allah. Prophet Muhammad said, in the la ibadan ikhtasam Allah has got certain category of people like you. He chosen them to be the servant of others, to be the, the people who help others, to be the people who be responsible for providing others with safety and security and food and everything. Akhtasam. In the Allah has chosen you to do this. To understand dealing with these groups, it's an art, it's a profession, as a principle, morality, values, culture, histories, messages, and it's a divine responsibility given to you by Allah. Given to each and every, and the lucky one of you is the one that Allah will choose him or her to carry on this responsibility. Young people, young people, let us challenge ourselves. Let us put our feet in their shoes our souls inside their souls or their bodies, their broken souls. 
and not to treat them, never treat them as, listen to this. Never treat them as, listen to this, please. Numbers of food packs, different times of tents, different clothing fashions to wear, different blankets, brands. Uh, this blanket, it, the, the individual became a, bl a blanket. Water tank style, doors or gates for a residence. Never ever treat them like these materials. You know why? They are not like that. They are like us. They are children of Adam. And they are all the children of Adam, as I mentioned earlier, and Adam has been created from clay. They are myself and yourself. My mother and your mother, my father and your father, my child and your children, my friends and your friends. They are human beings with feelings, with aspiration, with dreams, with emotion, with all this. With all this. Never ever treat them as numbers. Oh, no way. No way. They are the gay, the, 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 they are actually the, the, they are the keys which can let you enter the highest of heaven, inshallah. Okay? Let us energize and empower the role of whom? The role of women. And enable women to play their crucial role inside these social cycles of movement. Also, we have to activate the role of you, young people. The role of you, young people inside these communities to create the future community leadership, young people and women. In such community, my brothers and my sisters of refugees and displaced people, we can discover, we can discover and we have to discover the hidden treasures and pearls inside the dusty, muddy, crowded, shattered, broken communities of poverty. They are there. I saw this by my own eyes during the conflict in Bosnia. Professors standing in a queue to take a hand out from organizations. Scientists, artists, teachers, lecturers, doctors, engineers standing out. Treasures among the refugees, among the poor people, thinkers, thinkers, innovative. People you have to discover them, to discover them inside these com uh, communities of poverty. These suffering communities, believe me, are having a lot of talented people that they can offer to humanity. Very talented and pioneering people that they can offer. And even if you remember the story of Charlie Chaplin and how he was poor man and how his mother was unable to sustain his life, and how he became what he became later on. Let us believe, my young brothers and sisters, that we are the hired employees. By whom? By the poor and for the poor. It's number one principle. We are the hired employees by the poor and for the poor. The favor of poor people on us here in Europe, in Canada, in America, in Middle East, is like the favor of air on different creations of God. Can we live without air surrounding us? No way. And you can see now what's happening to people who are suffering from COVID and how are trying to send this kind of ventilators to them to get them oxygen and air. We have to build our relationship with the poor people on the foundation of what? Consolation, solacing, reconciliation, and observe these moral principles. What is our moral principles I can talk about? Many moral principles. I mentioned at the very beginning, the humanitarian principles which are dealing with the organization itself, organization program. But now 
We're talking the moral principles which is dealing with the behavior of the individual like myself and yourself. Number one, smile at your brother's or sister's face is a charity. Smile. Very simple. Smile. By the mercy of Allah, leniency. Leniency. So by the mercy of Allah, you were lenient. And if you had been rude or harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from about you. Leniency and softness. Number two. Number three, if a person forgives and makes reconciliation, talk about forgiveness and reconciliation, his reward is due from Allah. It's number three of the moral principles. Number four, but if you persevere patiently and guard against evil, then that will be a determining factor in all affairs. Patience, perseverance. Patience and perseverance. Number four. Who enter the pleasure to the people of a household of Muslim, Allah will see no reward for them but heaven. That's number five or six. The one who strives for the widows and poor is like the one who stands up for prayer without rest and as the one who observes fasting continuously without breaking the fasting. It's another one when we look at the social welfare of the widows and the orphan and the poor. Have you considered, listen to this, this is very, very important. I'm getting all these moral principles from my culture, my Islamic culture. Anybody can get it from their own culture, from Christian culture, from Jewish culture, from uh, Hindu culture, from Sikh culture, whatever you want. I'm not actually, but I'm very proud of my culture that I'm, I'm putting this on the table. Have you considered him who denies the religion? You know who's the one who denies the religion? It's the one who pushes orphan away as if he's the one who denies the religion. See? The second the second one is does not advocate for the needs of the to feed the needy at his principle not the humanitarian humanitarian principle number eight guard yourself against fire how even by giving half a date as a charity the equivalent of half a date as a charity this will protect you from going to hellfire Give them preference over themselves. They need the food, but they prefer to give this food to people who are in more need than themselves. These are the humanitarian, these are actually the moral principles which should be complementing the humanitarian principles, young men, young men and young women. And they feed out of love. The, the indignant, indignant, indignant orphan and the captive. They feed the miskin, the and the orphan and the captive of war out of love. This all this kind of moral principles are there for us to follow as individuals. And not let the hatred, and not let the hatred of others to you make you swerve to wrong and depart from justice. Be just, that is next to piety. This is principles. This is moral, moral, moral. We need to, we need to bring the moral principles to the hearts and the mind of the people who are dealing with these poor and disenfranchised communities. And you can add more of basic moral principles to be added to other humanitarian principles. Please, young men, young women, let us, let us complete 
the movement of our ancestors who started such a movement hundred years ago or maybe a thousand years ago. It, we are not going to start from scratch from the beginning, but we are actually going to complete what our ancestors in different parts of the world have done hundreds or thousands of years ago. I thank you very much uh, for listening to me today. And inshallah, uh, the celebration of Eid will be next week, either Wednesday, inshallah, or Thursday, it depends on starting with the moon. And I pray, and we should all pray for all our brothers and sisters from Muslim and non-Muslim background, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower them with his blessing, with comfort, with ease, particularly the people of Yugor, Rohingya, uh, Kashmir, uh, the people in India nowadays are suffering from COVID, and the people of Yemen, the people of Syria, the people of Iraq, the people of South Sudan, they have nearly a famine now. Two million people are outside Sudan, and uh, one million people displaced inside Sudan because of this kind of uh, conflict happening there. The people in uh, DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, the people in Niger, in Mali, in Chad, and uh, all these people, we need to pray for them and the others, the people in America, the people of the world, the people of the world, we need to pray for them while we celebrate our Eid, inshallah. Because our Eid can be Eid unless we bring happiness to two sides of the coin. Is my family, then a greater community, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.